Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness, the podcast dedicated to helping physicians in Michigan turn their professional success into financial success while enjoying life along the way. And now, here are your hosts, Andrew Mushbaugh and Trent DeBruin. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Physician's Guide to Financial Wellness. This is Trent DeBruin, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Andrew Mushbaugh. And today, we're going to talk about investing. And specifically, we're going to look at it through the lens of the Pareto Principle, which is also known as the 80-20 rule. And I'm sure many of you have heard of it, but it was originally developed by an Italian economist in the late 1800s. And it says that for whatever the given situation, 80% of the results tend to come from only 20% of the effort. And it's a powerful insight that says, while we're all doing a ton of things in our daily lives, it's typically a minority of our actions and efforts that truly move the needle for us. And Andrew and I are both big fans of this principle in our personal and professional lives. And we love that idea of focusing on the handful of essential things that will really make a difference. And it's amazing how many different areas it applies to, but one of them is investing. And in working with our clients, we're of course focused on also capturing that last 20% of results. But for the average person, this is a great framework to start with because for most people, they spend their time focusing on that last 20%, but miss the more important 80%. So what we're going to do today is share the five key principles that will get you most of the way there when it comes to investment success. And while some of them might seem simple or intuitive, actually applying them in practice can be the tough part. And in some ways, it's similar to health and fitness. So we all know the best way to lose weight and to get more fit is to eat well and work out, which seems simple, but it's actually difficult to execute in practice. So Andrew, why don't you kick us off with principle number one? Yeah, the first principle is that you should have a plan. You should always have a plan for why you're investing rather than just investing for the sake of it. And the reason it's important is that you're going to invest differently for different goals. So the way that you're saving for retirement is going to be different than the way that you're saving for college costs or a down payment in the near future. And the reason for that is, is because it's based on the time horizon until you need the money. So with retirement, typically you have a much longer time horizon until you need it. So you can have more in stocks and get that higher return, but also you're okay with some of the volatility because you don't need the money for a long period of time. Whereas if you're saving for goals in the near term, like college or that down payment, you know you need that money in a couple of years. And so you want to have more in bonds as opposed to having more in stocks because you want to have less volatility in that portfolio. And without knowing what you're investing for, it's tough to know exactly how you should invest. And it's also hard to assess progress on that performance that you have over time. So if investments are up 30%, is that good or bad? Are you on track or are you not? And the same is true if the market's down 20 or 30%. You know, will this have an impact on those goals and being able to fund them? Without knowing what you're saving and investing for, it's hard to be able to assess that actual progress. And so that's where the plan gives you that context. And it also helps you to tune out some of that day-to-day noise. You know, the financial media always likes to cite some crisis du jour or some random concern or reason why you shouldn't invest. But if you're investing for retirement and know you don't need the money for a longer time period, it's a lot easier to stay calm when the market is temporarily down 20 or 30 percent. And so when you're thinking about this goal-focused investing, it's a lot like cooking a turkey on Thanksgiving. You know, you're not going to open the oven to check in on the turkey's progress every five minutes because you know the process takes time and you need to be patient. And goal-focused investing should follow the same process. And it can be easy to fall into the trap of just wanting to make as much money as possible, but that's not really a goal and can actually get you into trouble thinking that way. And so when you're thinking about investment performance, you don't want to focus on beating your neighbor, the S&P 500, or some arbitrary benchmark. The only return that matters is what's required for you to achieve your goals. And that goes hand in hand with having a plan and knowing what needs to be done to achieve what's most important to you. And one of my favorite questions we'll get sometimes is, you know, what's your performance or what's your track record? And it's tough to answer this because each client portfolio is different since it's tailored to each client's specific goals, but everyone also has different cash flows of how they're saving and when they're saving. And so performance is going to be different for everyone. And the last little caveat to add in here is that when it comes to investment performance, you know, people only like to talk about their winners. So that colleague who talks about how he owned Tesla when it quadrupled probably also owned Kodak when it went bankrupt. Yeah, it's not as fun to talk about the losers, (laughs) is it? Not at all. (laughs) So that's the starting point, just making sure you have a plan and you know why you're investing. But once you have a plan, you want to then move on to principle number two, which is to focus on what matters. And going back to the fitness analogy, so if you're trying to lose weight, is it better to focus on things like picking out your workout clothes or your nutritional supplements? Or is it better to instead focus on eating well and exercising? And in life, it's so easy to get distracted by the non-essentials and lose sight of what will really move the needle. And the same is true when it comes to investing. You know, it's easy to get caught up in exactly which funds you should use or whether you should have 65% in U.S. stocks or 66%, but what matters more than anything is the percent you have invested in stocks versus bonds. 
And there have been a number of studies over time looking at this, and they all conclude that somewhere around 90% of your long-term investment return will be determined by this one factor. And the other things are ancillary to it. Yes, they can certainly help you do even better over time, but it's good to start here. And so why does that mix of stocks and bonds matter so much? Well, the biggest reason is because stocks have historically had much higher returns than bonds. So going back to the 1920s, it's been about twice as high. So stocks have returned around 10% per year on average, whereas bonds have been closer to 5%. And there's certainly no guarantee that that'll continue in the future, but that's been the trend over time. And the trade-off for these higher returns of stocks is that their prices move around a lot more. So some years they can be up 30%, some years they can be down 20%. And that price movement is known as volatility. And we like to joke that a bad day for stocks is like a bad year for bonds. So bonds tend to be much more steady and stable over time. And the higher returns for stocks are the investor's compensation for bearing their higher volatility or higher risk. Because when the price of something moves around a lot more, it's tougher to hold on to. So you'd be much more likely to panic and sell when the market's down 30% in a month, like we saw in the spring of this year. And this goes to the point on managing behavior, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And this relationship between return and volatility also speaks to that idea that risk and reward tend to be related when it comes to investing. You know, we all want one without the other. So we all want the returns of stocks with the volatility of bonds. But that's like wanting your dessert without the calories. And unfortunately, that's not possible. And the reason stocks are more volatile and risky than bonds is because they represent ownership in companies, whereas bonds represent lending money to companies. And it's riskier to be an owner than a lender because lenders get paid first. So that's why stocks are riskier and have more volatility. And keep in mind that there's no free lunch when it comes to investing, and you should always be skeptical of anything that promises it. So if you have someone pitching you the returns of stocks with the volatility of bonds, know that there's probably some catch there. What about that free steak dinner, though? (laughs) I can't turn that one down, right? (laughs) So overall, with principle number two, it's really important to know that getting that mix of stocks and bonds is an extremely important factor when looking at investing. All right. So now that you have your plan and know why you're investing and are focusing on what matters, having the right mix of stocks and bonds, the next thing to understand is diversification. And I always joke, the only place we wouldn't recommend diversification is with your marriage. Agreed. (laughs) And we all know that expression of don't put your eggs all in one basket. And the same idea is true with investing. You want to spread out your investments. So you don't just want to own a handful of stocks and bonds, but you want to own thousands of those. And you don't want to just own U.S. stocks, but you also want to own stocks across the world. And that's because the U.S. only makes up something about 50% of the global stock market. I think people are often surprised by that. We come across a lot of prospects who have 100% invested in U.S. stocks. And that tends to be the case for a lot of people where they just don't realize there's this huge opportunity out there to diversify. And actually, what a relatively smaller portion of the total global stock market the U.S. does represent. Yeah, it's true. There's certainly different levels of diversification. You know, Just because you have a lot in the U.S. stocks with thousands of them, well, we wouldn't view that as being fully diversified. And the reason it's so important to be diversified is because you want to reduce your risk. Any individual company that you hold could easily go bankrupt. It's extremely unlikely that it would happen to a diversified portfolio, much less one that's spread out globally. And the last thing you want to have happen is one investment to impact your actual life and meeting some of those goals you have. And it also helps have a smoother ride over time. So not all investments will move in the same direction at the same time. You know, something what's happening in the US versus Europe versus emerging market countries are all going to be different. And some of those fluctuations tend to offset. And by doing that, it also improves your returns. So a diversified investment portfolio tends to perform better than one that's not diversified over longer periods of time. And luckily, diversification is easy to do with investment funds like mutual funds and ETFs. So you don't have to worry about going out and buying thousands of individual stocks or bonds by yourself. And you can instead choose to invest in these mutual funds and ETFs. Yeah, you can own as few as you know two, three, four, five funds. And that alone can give you exposure to thousands of stocks and bonds all across the world. Yeah, absolutely. And by diversifying, you still own the next Amazon and the Apple. You just don't own too much of it. And that whole idea there is that you don't own enough of one thing to make a killing, but you also don't own enough to be killed. And so a sign of diversification is having some investments that are doing worse while others are doing better. And that's exactly what you want to have happen. But it can be tough for people to see this in a portfolio and view it as a positive. Because, you know, it's very tempting to want to be all in on the best performer. But we know that during other periods, that best performer will be the worst performer, which is exactly what diversification is. You know, it's exactly like being in a family with 13 kids. You know, there's always going to be someone that's in trouble. (laughs) 
And you shouldn't need to focus on hitting home runs to achieve your financial goals. Because if you're doing that, then that's really just you trying to make up for a lack of savings or wanting to retire earlier than you may be able to. And so instead of focusing on trying to make up for that lost savings by hitting home runs with your investments, a better approach is just to focus on hitting singles and doubles and do that on a consistent basis. But even with a well-diversified portfolio, there's more that you can do to improve your investment experience. And that brings us to principle number four, which is to control costs. And there are many different costs in investing, and they all have a direct impact on your returns. These can be things like underlying expenses for the investment funds you own, taxes, trading costs. And a good way to think about this is with a bucket analogy. So let's say Andrew and I each have a bucket and a hose, and we're trying to fill up our buckets with water, where the amount of water in the bucket is the value of our investment. And the water we're pouring into the bucket is the amount that we're saving and investing. But the only catch here is the buckets have holes in them, which represent these different costs. And this is water that drains out of our buckets as we're trying to fill them. And the key difference is I'm being intentional about trying to minimize these, but Andrew isn't. And because of this, the holes in his bucket are much bigger. So if we're both running our hoses at the same speed, Whose bucket do you think is going to fill faster? And it's the same way in investing, where each of us has some control over the size of the holes in our buckets, and we can do certain things to minimize how big they are. So we'll take a minute here to explain more about these and some of the things you can do. So with the first cost, underlying expenses for investment funds, these are often referred to as expense ratios, and there can be a big range. I mean, for some actively managed funds, they can be as high as 1.5% or more, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, for some passive index funds that can be 0.1% or less. And the difference between actively managed funds and index funds is that with the actively managed funds, you have investment managers who are actually trying to pick stocks. You know, is Pepsi going to do better than Coke? Is Amazon going to do better than Netflix? And time when to buy the stocks and when to get in and out of the market. And the money you're paying to this fund manager takes away from your investment performance. And in theory, you're paying a higher expense ratio because there's potential to do better than the market. But in reality, the decades of academic research have shown that it's nearly impossible for anyone to consistently time the market or pick winners and losers. So in general, actively managed funds as a whole tend to underperform their respective indices. And the next cost is taxes. So you want to be smart with taxes when you're managing your investments. And one of the first things you want to make sure you do is to save to tax advantaged accounts. So you always want to fill up that tax advantage saving space first before saving to other accounts. And even within your overall investment portfolio, you can be smart about owning the right investments in the right accounts. So different types of accounts have different treatment for tax purposes. And because of that, you can be strategic with which investments you own in which accounts to minimize the overall drag from taxes over time. And also, if you have a taxable investment account, you can be smart about how you sell investments and recognize gains. So if you have an investment that you've held for more than a year, when you sell it, you pay long-term capital gains taxes, which are paid at a lower rate. Whereas if you hold it for less than a year and sell it, those gains will be taxed at ordinary income rates, which are much higher for most people. And a third thing you can do with taxes is if you have a taxable investment account during periods when the market's down, such as the spring of this year, you can do what's called tax loss harvesting. So if you have an investment in a losing position, you can sell it and immediately buy a different investment in its place. And by doing that, you can remain invested in the market while still capturing that temporary loss for tax purposes. And the third cost with investing is trading costs. So typically, there's a transaction cost associated with making a trade. And this is something that's continued to fall over time, but it's still relevant. And here, you really want to avoid trading your investments and your portfolio more than what's necessary. And so only trade when it makes sense financially. And it's really important to focus on these things because they're directly in your control, which is unlike other aspects of investing, like the returns for the stock and bond markets. Yeah. And finally, we saved the best for last with the investment principle number five, and that's managing your behavior, which tends to be the most important and also the most challenging. Of course, not everyone thinks this applies to them. Just like if you pulled a room of people and asked how many people think they are above average drivers, you're going to get a lot more than 50% of the hands that go up. And humans are naturally wired to be poor investors. You know, we're emotional beings with behavioral biases that tend to get in our own way. You know, just like I irrationally think Michigan's going to win the national championship every year. Same for me with Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're both <laughs> irrational. When it comes to investing, people are also irrational there. And we tend to swing between states of greed and fear. We want to buy more at the top and sell more at the bottom. 
And there's actually a lot of studies out there that show that the average investor underperforms their own investment. Or said differently, if the average investor just did nothing and let their investment be there for 10 years, they would have done better than the tinkering that most people try to do with their portfolio because of that behavioral bias. And the difference is quite dramatic, and it's often several percent each year. And so when you extrapolate that out over longer periods of time, the impact can be massive. And there are many different things we can discuss on the topic of behavioral management, but one of the biggest ones is this idea of timing the market. And when you're thinking about timing the market or predicting what's going to happen in the future, you know, another one of my favorite questions we get is, well, why don't we just sell at the top and buy at the bottom? That seems like a good idea to me. Yeah, yeah it's a little easier said than done. And you know, there's no bell that rings at the top or the bottom. And so outside of that, nobody can consistently do either. You, know, you may be able to do it once or twice. And even those professionals on CNBC can't do it consistently. And so it might be hard to believe because it's in complete contrast to what you're hearing you know, in the financial media, whether that's on TV or what you're reading. And the old adage holds true that even a broken clock is right twice a day. So don't confuse luck with being able to time or predict what the market will do. You know, I always like to joke that, you know, what's the difference between your neighbor talking about investment portfolio performance and a broken clock? Well, the broken clock doesn't brag about the two out of 1,440 times that it's right. And humans like to have an element of control and certainty. So it's natural to want to believe that someone has complete control or can predict the future, but it just doesn't work that way. And there are also incentives for people to continue this idea of market timing being a thing. And the media, their whole goal of their business is to draw in more attention and viewers. So they have to try to push this narrative out there. And then there's also an incentive for the financial services industry. If it's viewed as their value add of trying to time the market or pick which stocks and do better, it's more activity and is in their incentive to try to have this idea of timing the market as something that's actually a value add for them. And so many people think or want you to think that successful investing involves a lot of activity, picking those winners or losers or timing the market. But in reality, successful investing should be boring. It's coming up with the right plan and strategy and then sticking with it over time. You know, it's just like getting in shape or losing weight. It's supposed to be boring. It doesn't happen overnight, but doing the right things on a daily basis over a longer period of time really starts to show up where things compound and you'll get the results that you want. And we all want that shortcut, like wearing an ab belt or taking apple cider vinegar to lose weight, but there are just no shortcuts with investing. But just because it's boring doesn't mean it's easy. You know, it requires, as investors, you have to accept the uncertainty and unpredictability of the future. And it also requires us to be disciplined during some of those uncomfortable periods where volatility shows up, thinking back to 2008 or 2009, or even most recently in the spring of 2020. If you think back to how you felt in March of 2020, when there's all that uncertainty around COVID and what will happen, it didn't feel good to invest then. But when the market has fallen as much as it has, then it's natural for people to want to wait until the coast is clear or things feel better before they start investing again. But that's what every investor thinks, and that's what they want. Everyone wants this feeling of certainty. But since every investor thinks that way, where do you think the market will be when it happens? And we've already experienced this firsthand, where people are still waiting to invest because they want that certainty, yet the market's just shot up since the bottom on March 24th. And so just as the best time to invest new cash is typically when things feel the worst, the opposite is true when it comes to selling. The worst time to sell is typically when things feel the worst. And so we always have the saying that it's not about timing the market, it's about time in the market. And you're thinking about how important behavioral management is, it's the most important thing. Because even if you do everything else right, have the right mix of stocks and bonds, you have a diversified portfolio that's low cost and you're being tax efficient, if you can't manage your emotions and handles the up and downs of investing, you're not going to have a successful investment experience. So that covers it with the five principles we wanted to share with you today. And while it's easier said than done, if you're able to apply these consistently, you'll dramatically improve your chances of having a successful investment outcome. And just to summarize the points, so point number one is to have a plan rather than investing for the sake of it. Number two is to focus on what matters. And the biggest thing there is that mix of stocks and bonds. Number three is diversify your investments. So make sure you're owning thousands of stocks or bonds all across the globe. Point four, control costs, things like investment expenses, taxes, and trading costs. And lastly, and most importantly, point number five is to manage your behavior through the ups and the downs of the market. And hopefully this was a helpful discussion and maybe provided some perspective that you hadn't heard before or at least gave you a new way of looking at things. And we always love the quote by Mike Tyson that everyone has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. And he's always so eloquent, but it's true. You know, when the market's doing well, it's easy to feel fine about your investments and comfortable with everything, but that can change in a hurry as soon as the markets start to fall. But by following the 80-20 rule with investing, you can have a plan for how to navigate the ups and downs of the market to ensure that you have that successful investment experience. 
And we appreciate you joining us for another episode. And we thank you for the time you spend with us. If you have thoughts to share or questions you'd like to have answered, feel free to email us at info at mdwmllc.com. And you can also visit the podcast page of our website, mdwmllc.com forward slash podcast to access the show notes and everything we covered today. And we also added a new resource on there. It's a guide to optimizing your finances as an employed physician. So you're welcome to download that if it's something of interest. Take care, everyone, and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to make smart financial decisions? Check out the resources section of MD Wealth Management's website at mdwmllc.com, where you'll find additional knowledge and insight for Michigan physicians, including a blog, ebook, and one page guides. While there, you can also schedule a 15 minute conversation with Andrew and Trent to learn more about what it means to work with the firm and how they serve physicians. If you've enjoyed the content, please leave a review on iTunes and share with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for listening. Andrew Mushbaugh and Trent DeBruin are certified financial planners, principals, and co-founders of MD Wealth Management, a registered investment advisory firm in the state of Michigan. All opinions shared in the show are for general information and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and no guarantee of future returns. Please consult with your legal advisor, your tax advisor, or your financial advisor before making any decisions.